On the 19th day of October, Halloween gave to me 19 D's renting, 18 francs perving, 17 angels stripping, 16 demons jazzercising, 15 runes on parchment, 14 Joseph's whispering, 13 seniors bleeding, 12 creepy masks, 11 dancing demons, 10 Catholic monsters, 9 priests of miracling, 8 Jerry's vamping, 7 Jody's oinking, 6 bodies swapping, 5 reeds of wolfing, four drunken uncles, three werewolf colonies, two spooky sisters, and a psycho who killed Janet Lee. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the 19th of 31 days of Halloween. Uh, I hope you are having an excellent Tuesday, and uh, we are, again, approaching the end of the 31 days of Halloween, which is really upsetting to me, because I love this time of year. Uh, I, no lie, I've been busy as all heck, but I enjoy it so much, I wish that Halloween were all year long, um, and instead we've just got to hold it in our hearts. And speaking of holding Halloween in our hearts all year long... Let us turn our attention to the uh, subject of today's film. And this is a movie that I really adore and have for a long time. It was really my introduction to Ty West. And of course, this is uh, House of the Devil from 2009, which it's hard to believe that this movie is now 12 years old. But there we have it. And it's... uh, in a lot of ways, this felt like Ty West's coming out party. I know he had directed features before this, and a lot of people uh, are really fond of The Roost. I actually haven't seen The Roost yet. I feel like I need to, but uh, I've also heard mixed things, so I haven't... I, you know, I'll get to it. I'll get to it, everybody. Everybody just calm down. Put down the pitchforks and torches. Uh, but it, <laughs> So I didn't see The Roost, but I when I saw uh, House of the Devil... It was one of those things where director sensibilities and my own align almost perfectly. And Ty West is is sort of in that mumblecore kind of group with, you know, people like Mark Duplass and Greta Gerwig, who is in this movie, um, A.J. Bowen. You know, a lot of the staples of this film movement uh, appear in in Ty West's film. Ty West himself appeared in... Uh, you're next. I mean, it's that group of filmmakers. And uh, Ty West, you know, clearly has a fondness for, you know, that 70s era supernatural horror film, which I do as well. And, you know, he creates a film here that looks a lot like that. And the broad strokes of the plot, if you've never seen it, are that. Uh, a young woman played by Jocelyn Donahue, who you may remember from uh, Doctor Sleep, is I think the last thing I saw her in. But she's been uh, in in lots of stuff. Uh, she plays a, a young woman named Samantha, who is renting a place or about to rent a place from D. Wallace, God bless her, who appears in this movie for a few minutes. But she's uh, she's kind of great as the landlady who is uh, renting Jocelyn Donahue a place and says like, hey, I'm going to rent you this place. I'm not going to force you to pay a security deposit or anything, but you just need to pay the first month's rent, which is 300 bucks. And Jocelyn Donahue doesn't have $300, but what she does have is a can-do spirit and uh, a flyer for a babysitter that is needed. And so she responds to this ad and It turns out that a a couple played by Tom Noonan, the amazing Tom Noonan, and Mary Waranoff, also the amazing Mary Waranoff, want her to (laughs) babysit uh, her, Mary Waranoff's, like, aged mother, as it happens, uh, for uh, the the night of a, a lunar eclipse that a lot of people have come to this little town to observe. And Greta Gerwig plays her friend Megan, who uh, drives her to and from this gig and is also the most reasonable character in the movie because when they arrive at the babysitting gig uh, <laughs> and, and they get a look at uh, uh, Tom Noonan as the, the guy who's hiring them or hiring Samantha, 
Greta Gerwig is immediately like, this is fucked. You need to get out of here. You're in the middle of nowhere. This family seems weird. Also, they told you it was going to be a babysitting gig, and it turns out it's an adult that you're babysitting, and that was not on the table either. So you would be best served by just getting the fuck out. But uh, she needs the money. Samantha needs the money, you know? Uh, She kind of uh, gets the guy, uh, Tom Noonan, to uh, pay her $400, which would be her first month's rent and a little more. And that ain't no small change in the 1970s when this is set, or early 80s, whenever, uh, uh, I think it is early 80s, is is technically when this is set. But and, And so, you know, what happens is she ends up staying alone in this house and their creepy things start happening and one thing leads to another and there's devil worship and you know the big complaint that you might have with this movie is that it's a bit of a slow burn and there's no doubt about it it definitely is it builds to a crescendo but i think that crescendo is pretty great along the way it is just dripping in atmosphere which i also really like Um, and it's just, you know, anchored by these terrific performances from, you know, Greta Gerwig, who's in a really small role to Jocelyn Donahue, who is the star and she's fantastic and charismatic and buoyant and all the things you want your lead actress to be. Uh, Tom Noonan is spectacularly creepy as Mr. Ullman, Mary Warrenov, uh, who, you know, was like a, a pal with. Uh, Paul Bartell and did a lot of Roger Corman stuff like she's amazing as Mrs. Ullman even though she's not in it that much um AJ Bowen uh is the you know sort of muscle for this group and that's pretty great as well it you know there's just a lot of little touches to it all like there's not a corner of this movie that isn't cared about the framing of the shots is terrific there's always sort of that weird uh, foreground image with something happening in the background. Um, you know, it, it, it beautiful lighting, uh, this really saturated look to everything that also calls to mind. Like, it, it's a nostalgia film without being pointedly nostalgic about a particular thing. It just captures the vibe of a time of movie making. And that is what I really like. I, in terms of nostalgia for me, if you want to make your movie like, a, you know, a late 70s, early 80s, supernatural, you know, devil movie, then that is the thing that I can get behind as opposed to a specific like, hey, remember, you know, I, I'm harping on Halloween Kills here a little bit, but remember the that character Lonnie that was mentioned once in Halloween? Well, here's a whole movie where he's a major character. Like, that shit doesn't impress me nearly as much as a filmmaker who sort of understands why a movie um, or a, an era of movie making is significant and and also how to capture the look and feel of that, both n- not just in terms of the quality of the film stock and that sort of thing, but the music cues and the framing of the shots and the lighting and all of that stuff and it, it, and Ty West gets it all just right in House of the Devil um, the music was done by Graham Resnick who, who's a terrific composer uh, and he has a little cameo as a DJ in this movie um, and the, the music is just right as well there are a couple of needle drops in the movie uh, to kind of help sell the time period and I both of the songs used uh, as needle drops I kind of love and not just because they're used in this movie I just kind of love those movies besides but or um, those songs besides but uh, yeah it, it's not overused like you don't have a needle drop every 10 minutes there's just a couple but those couple of needle drops are exactly what you need and, and there's a, a terrific moment where Jocelyn Donahue is just kind of dancing around the house while she's listening to her Walkman. And it's great. You know, it, it tells you some stuff about the character and how uh, she's finally feeling a little bit at ease and how she's using music to kind of settle herself. And then that just turns into uh, her, you know, dropping a vase and, and things getting even worse than they were before. Um, if I have a complaint with the movie, 
I would guess that it is uh, the fact that when she gets a pizza delivered to her, that she hugs the the pizza box to her chest in a way that would absolutely ruin the pizza. But, man, eh, what are you going to do? Um, that's really the biggest complaint I have with the movie. Everything else about it I kind of love. Uh, back in the day, I wrote a review of this movie that was me writing a letter to the film to talk about how much I loved what it did. And in watching the movie again, I still feel that way. I, I It's a movie that I think knows what it wants to be and executes on that with a confidence and a high degree of success that is hard to argue. Um, there's a, you know, kind of a surprise death uh, early in the movie that just lets you know, hey, things are not what they seem, but that still I find kind of shocking and I think it's really well done. Yeah, it's just great. And, and let me emphasize once more how fucking good Tom Noonan is in this movie. Tom Noonan, uh, if you if you don't know him as an actor, he was in The Last Action Hero where he played one of the villains in that. Um, he was the, uh, the Tooth Fairy in the Red Dragon adaptation Manhunter years ago with uh, Joan Allen and William Peterson, a terrific Michael Mann movie. And one of the early looks, Brian Cox played Hannibal Lecter. If you've never seen Manhunter, you ought to see Manhunter. It's a, a wonderful film. But his performance as the serial killer in that is so, like, human and wonderful and chilling. And Tom Noonan just has one of those faces and voices that, God bless him, like, I'm sure he's a wonderfully nice guy. I would be genuinely surprised if he weren't. But he just has one of those demeanors that suggests that he's kind of sinister. And he's so good in this where he, the, you can always tell there's this threat of violence, that there's something under the surface. Like, there's a great moment where he asks uh, Samantha, Jocelyn Don Donahue's character, to come meet with him in the kitchen to uh, so he can sort of level with her that, oh, this isn't really a baby that you're babysitting. It's actually my wife's mother. And here's why I'm willing to pay you a little more. And Samantha rises to leave. And he just whip fast is up and grabbing her arm. And you're like, oh, this guy's dangerous. And, and Samantha even sees that. She registers it. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. And he has this very quiet, almost ASMR-like delivery in a lot of his lines where he seems he seems very reasonable and he's speaking to you in a very calm tone. But under it all, you understand that there is something, you know, it turns out diabolical, but it, but something malevolent is, is happening in this situation. And you get a couple of, like, reveals. You know, Ty West shows you some stuff that Samantha doesn't know. And it's just there in a very Hitchcockian way to let you, the audience, know that there's some heinous shit happening here that she's not aware of, but she is in great danger. And then there's the payoff of the movie, which I really like. I like, you know, what I, I've said this before, but a dark song really spoiled me on devil worship and black magic kind of movies because I think every ceremony should be as difficult as the one in a dark song that that makes sense to me, <laughs> you know, in, in terms of uh, performing uh, black demonic rituals. I feel like that is the thing that ought to, ought to happen, that, that it, it ought to cost you something. It ought to take some time. And this one, though, is very particular. It's more like on this night, you know, and but it, it doesn't ever, like, lay it out explicitly. It just assumes that you've seen a couple of horror movies in your life. And so that you know, hey, a creepy family doing creepy shit on the night of a lunar eclipse, well, that probably means they're up to devil stuff, and and sure enough, they are. But it doesn't ever give you that exposition dump, nor does it need to. You know everything you need to know um, based on the pentagrams and, and murders <laughs> happening around her that uh, she she is not only in danger, but she is perhaps in danger of more than her life. And... Yeah, uh, House of the uh, House of the Devil just uh, is such a terrific movie. Um, a really like confident and, and sort of audacious movie at times. Uh, Ty West has gone on to do some movies that I don't like as much as House of the Devil. You know, uh, he did that uh, that sequel to Cabin Fever, and it, that is sort of 
much discussed as a movie that was sort of taken away from him and, and recut and whatnot. Uh, but I, he also did The Innkeepers, which I adore. Uh, and The Sacrament, which I think is good, but I think, you know, there was a mistake made in trying to disguise the fact that this is ultimately a Jonestown movie. Um, and he's got a new movie coming out called X that I don't know anything about, but I'm excited to see it. And in between, he's done, you know, plenty of television television work and so forth, kept himself uh, busy. And I think all that's great, but I'm, I'm looking forward to him doing more features because I think he's a great director. And I, I think he definitely has um, th- the chops to make more great movies. I think he's made two great movies and then some good stuff. And and that's, you know, hey, there <laughs> that, that's more than you can say for like an Ed Wood or something. So he's a, a talented guy. And I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully him getting back to form with uh, his next movie X. But we'll see. I haven't seen that Western he did either in A Valley of Violence and... I'm curious about that because I like Westerns too. I had to watch that and not be a jerk. Um, But anyway, look, uh, I think that's going to do it for our discussion of House of the Devil. Uh, Like I said, I'm I'm over the moon for House of the Devil. I think it's a wonderful movie. It's the reason I wanted it to be last in the discussion.